Well, good evening, everybody. We begin again this week with the same passage of Scripture that we began with last week, so just sit still and listen to the Word of the Lord. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the eagerly awaiting creation waits for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only that, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, through perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Now in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we should, But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew... He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring charges against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, but rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. And who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or trouble, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we were regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And so we begin with the same passage of Scripture that we started with last week because this week we're going to be completing our study on Ignatius. And what we see with Ignatius is that he is living these words of Romans chapter 8. When we look at his seven letters that he wrote in the final days of his life as he is being led to Rome, to the arena, to die for his faith in Christ, we see a picture personified of these words of the Apostle Paul. Here is a man in Ignatius who is convinced that nothing will separate him from the love of Christ. Not wild lions, not the sword, 
not anything that the Roman Empire can do to him. And so with that, our faith is encouraged. And so this evening, we're going to be finishing out Ignatius, as well as starting our next uh, church father, a man by the name of Irenaeus. And so with that, let's pray, and we'll jump into our lesson this evening. Father, we thank you so much that you have not only given us words of wisdom, godly words of wisdom, godly words of righteousness, but God, these words have power for faith and life and conduct that truly we can grasp this book and the truths that are in it and by your Holy Spirit have our lives conformed to them and see incredible results. So, Father, I pray that as we study Ignatius this evening, as we begin Irenaeus, God, that you would continue to work in our lives to call us to greater feats of faith and perseverance, which is ultimately a reflection of the truth of your word. So, Father, we ask you to do work in us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we begin this evening with uh, Ignatius. We're just going to pick right up where we left off last week, so you, there is no new outline for your study this evening. We'll just finish up the one you had last week. But there were two more handouts, and that will be for Irenaeus, which uh, we'll get to here briefly. Um, it's not going to probably take us too long to finish up Ignatius. We're going to make a few uh, highlights and observations from his life. And then we'll jump into. So if you're, if you're trying to figure out where to put those two documents that I gave you this evening, they go under your Irenaeus section, not in your Ignatius section. So uh, if, you, if you get lost in all of that, you know, like how do I organize, because I'm giving you a lot of material, come and see me and I'll help you organize it, okay? It's, it's not a big deal. So, so Ignatius, we, um, we've already looked a lot at his... Uh, the final days of his life, we find that he was the pastor in Antioch, or the bishop, and uh, he was arrested for his faith. We don't know the whole details behind his arrest, uh, but in the process, he is led from Antioch to Rome, to the Colosseum, where he is going to be executed for his faith, and we get the impression that he knows how it's going to happen. It's going to be through the means of wild beasts. And, uh, but along the way, he is allowed to write seven letters, and so he chooses to write six letters to six churches, and then his, probably his final letter uh, to the bishop of Smyrna, which is Polycarp. And so we've already looked at uh, his letter to the Ephesians, his letter to the Romans. We looked uh, last week just at some highlights of his letter to the Magnesians. And then if I'm not mistaken, we also looked at a uh, brief highlight uh, to the Trollians, the, the church in Trollis. And so this evening we pick up with highlights in his letter to the Philadelphians. Now this is not... Uh, we're not talking about the United States, right? We're talking about a completely different city, uh, Philadelphia, um, the ancient city of Philadelphia, not the newer one in America, okay? So, letter to the Philadelphians, and we're just looking at highlights here, right? So, we're, uh, if you want the complete document, ask me for it, I can get it to you, but, but we're just, for sake of time, just looking at some highlights, and uh, mostly because a lot of this stuff does overlap, right? What he says to the Romans, he says to the Ephesians, what he says to the Ephesians, he uh, also says to the Magnesians, and so on and so forth. So let's just look at this, and this was uh, something I picked out and thought maybe it'd be helpful for us in our faith. So Ignatius says, therefore, as children of the light of truth, flee from division and false teaching. Where the shepherd is, there follow like sheep. For many seemingly trustworthy wolves attempt, by means of wicked pleasure, to take captive the runners in God's race. But in your unity, they will find no opportunity. And we've seen with Ignatius that he's very big on church unity, right? And, uh, and at the core of that is, is um, fellowship amongst the, uh, amongst the church members, as well as uh, following the bishop, right? So this is kind of what he's talking about here. And he goes on to say... Stay away from the evil plants, right? Those who teach 
false things, which are not cultivated by Jesus Christ because they are not the Father's planting. Not that I found any division among you, but instead I found that there had been a purification. For all those who belong to God and Jesus Christ are with the bishop, and all those who repent and enter into the unity of the church will belong to God, that they may be living in accordance with Jesus Christ. Do not be misled, my brothers. If anyone follows a schismatic or somebody who causes division, right? Schism, division. If anyone follows a schismatic, he will not inherit the kingdom of God. If anyone holds to alien views, right? False teachings. He disassociates himself from the passion, right? The suffering of Christ, which, um, which procures our salvation, okay? So let's just make an observation here. And we'll just simply say this about what we read, is that Ignatius calls the church to unity, and he's done this in every single letter. He calls the church to unity how through the rule of truth, right, biblical truth, stay away from the false teachers, stay away from the evil plantings, they're just going to cause division, so calls the church to unity through the rule of truth, how? By following the bishop who thus follows Christ. And uh, we see here echoes of Paul who said, follow me as I follow Christ, right? It's this, this whole idea that God has, has chosen certain individuals to lead the church, and um, they are the ones that the sheep are to follow. And in that, he argues there is strength and there is safety in that unified whole, right? Shepherd and sheep. And uh, any thoughts about that? I mean... Uh, Agree? Disagree? Or should we just, you know what, the, the pastor's just, he doesn't know what he's talking about, we really shouldn't listen to him. <laughs> I'm giving you an opportunity here. Yeah, right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think you're right, and I think that's why it's qualified here with through the rule of truth, right? That that, that has to be center to everything, and uh, you know, if you have a pastor that all of a sudden is teaching that uh, uh, Jesus is the half brother of Lucifer, and and uh, you know is just as sinful as the devil, well, there's a problem with that shepherd. You probably shouldn't follow him, right? So it's not as if the bishop or the pastor doesn't have accountability, right? This book is, is one, uh, one way that the pastor is to be accountable. So, um, yeah, Janet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. And not only that, but any authority of this book to guide his life. It's just a bunch of stories. I mean, come on, take it or leave it, right? They're just fables and myths, and maybe they're beneficial to help me get through my week, but, you know, as far as authority, nah, right, yeah, I've heard the argument, so. So I think this is a good rule, right? And so we could talk a lot more about this, but you need to understand that the church is in its infancy, And here comes Ignatius, right? Why is this important to us today? Because here's Ignatius who is really just setting the record straight. If your church wants to be strong and safe and secure, then listen to the pastor, listen to the bishop who is, if he is a healthy bishop, he is in the truth and he is following Christ very, very closely. And that's just good advice, right? I mean, that's that's, uh, at a foundational level, that's very, very important. Okay, let's keep going here. We want to get to, Igne- or, uh, to Irenaeus here in a little bit. So let's look at his letter to the Smyrnians, uh, the church in Smyrna. Uh, what's important about the church in Smyrna? Is there any connection? We've talked about this a little bit. Who's their pastor? Polycarp. Polycarp. Right, so this is Polycarp's church. 
And uh, we want to start out by observing that Ignatius says, your prayer reached the church at Antioch in Syria. And so the question is, okay, what, what is he talking about here, right? He's, Ignatius is saying, your prayers have reached my church, right? So he was the pastor in the church of Antioch, taken out of there, and he wants the Smyrnians to know that their prayer has been effective. And so he's given them a prayer update of sorts, and he goes on to explain, Therefore, in order that your work may become perfect both on earth and in heaven, it is appropriate that your church appoint, for the honor of God, a godly ambassador to go to Syria to congratulate them because they are at peace and have regained their proper stature and their corporate life has been re- restored to its proper state. And so, so, there's, um, so he is... He is um, admonishing the Smyrnians that your prayers have been effective and you need to appoint an ambassador to go to Antioch and congratulate the church. And so we're putting all these clues together and we're wondering, okay, what's happened in Antioch? Something good has happened in Antioch. And he says, now they are at peace. Now they have regained their proper stature and their corporate life as a church has been restored. And so it's like, what? okay, something good has happened here, right? What they're praying for has happened. What is it? We get some more clues here. It seemed to me, therefore, to be a deed worthy of God for you to send one of your own people with a letter that he might join in glorifying the tranquility which by God's will has come to them, and because they have now reached, thanks to your prayers, a safe harbor. And so more details come to light that, okay, the church is, uh, they were in danger, their pastor had been taken from them, now they're safe again, and we put all these clues together along with the rest of this letter that gives us more information, and we conclude that Antioch now has a pastor again. So he had been... Um, in his first four letters, he had, he had asked those churches to pray for his church in Antioch that they would get another bishop, right? Because a, a flock of sheep without a shepherd is in a very precarious situation. And, uh, and so now he's writing to the Smyrnians and saying, ah, your prayers were effective. They have reached Antioch. God has heard your cry and uh, they are in a safe harbor again. Why? Because they now have a bishop again. So you need to glorify God, pick out an ambassador, send a letter of congratulations, and, and uh, affirm this in them. So this is really very interesting, right? Because it shows, um, though they are separated by great distance, right? And this is before the time of airplanes and internet and cell phones. But they want, Ignatius stresses that you need to communicate and stay in contact with each other, even if it means, you know, sending a delegate, um, you know, away from his home for I don't know how long it would take to go from Smyrna to Antioch, but, but this was something very important, that they would stay connected and, uh, and stay, you know, just in the know with each other of what's happening in each other's church. And, and I think this is a, an important word for us today, right? I mean, we, we, uh, we see this in the American culture where we've become very isolated as Christians and, uh, and as churches and and I think that we could learn something here from Ignatius. So, observation is this. Ignatius rejoices at the restoration of peace in Antioch through the appointment of a new bishop, which was made possible by their prayer. So, he gives, he gives them some credit here, and he says, thank you for praying. It has reached Antioch and has been effective. And then the last letter is his letter to Polycarp, and uh, I find this one especially dear because it's from a a wizened old pastor to another pastor, and and there's just some very good nuggets of of practical truth, and and so I've got a whole shotgun blast of of, uh, quotes here from this letter. He opens up by saying this to Polycarp, he says, I urge you by the grace with which you are clothed to press on in your race and to exhort all people that they may be saved. Do justice to your office with constant care for both physical and spiritual concerns. Focus on unity. So there's that theme of unity again. Polycarp, focus on unity in your church, for there is nothing better. Bear with all people, even as the Lord bears with you. Endure all in love, just as you now do. Devote yourself to unceasing prayers. Ask for greater understanding than you have. Keep on the alert with an unresting spirit. 
Speak to the people individually in accordance with God's example. Bear the diseases of all, right? Probably a <laughs> way of describing sin, right? He's probably not talking about a cold or the flu here. <laughs> He's probably t- talking about sin. Bear the, se- the sins of all as a perfect athlete. Where there is more work, there is much gain. And I like that last sentence, right? Because uh, Polycarp is probably weighed down with a lot of problems, as most pastors are. And, uh, but Ignatius says, you know what? There may be a lot of work to do in your church, but you need to understand the bigger picture. There's a lot to be gained. And so that's, that's good advice. Uh, another highlight, if you love good disciples, it is no credit to you. Rather, with gentleness, bring the more troublesome ones into submission, right? It's easy to love the good sheep, right? The ones who bring their Bible with them to, on, you know, Sunday morning and show up every week. You know, those are, you know, it's easy to love those, but he points out, um, you know, don't ignore the other ones that really need help too, right? Anyway, a lot could be said about that. He goes on to say, do not let those who appear to be trustworthy, yet who teach strange doctrines, baffle you. So he's talking about false teachers. And it says, instead, stand firm, like an anvil being struck with a hammer, right? This picture of resoluteness with the truth of God's word, right? Don't, don't get, you know, don't be bewildered by those who teach these weird heresies. We're going to get into with Irenaeus, this Gnosticism that's just bizarre. It's a science fiction, really. All of these things going on. Don't be distracted by them. Don't let it, don't let it, you know, mess you up. Instead, stand firm like an anvil that's being struck by a hammer. Another one, do not let the widows be neglected. After the Lord, you be their guardian, right? So, the, the widows in the church, right, Paul taught the same thing. Um, you know, if they are widows indeed with no family to care for them, then it is the church's responsibility to care for them. And Ignatius really takes it a step further as far as the detail of it goes and says, you as the pastor need to be number one as their guardian in their life. As, you know, the qualification that uh, Paul would make uh, if they have no family that can take care of them. Right, if they're widows indeed, is how Paul puts it to Timothy, I believe it is. So that's good advice. He also says, let meetings, church meetings, be held more frequently and seek out everybody by name, right? Don't, uh, you know, people might disappear for a while. Don't let them disappear, right? Call them out by name and say, hey, we're having church. You need to come and join us in fellowship and worship. And also he says this, flee from wicked practices, better yet, preach sermons about them. (laughs) I like that too, (laughs) right? So it's, uh, you know, get into people's business a little bit when they're walking in sin or or temptations of the flesh and, and preach sermons about it, you know? And why is that? Just to make people feel uncomfortable? No, no. It's so that they can find life, so they can find victory over sin. Not so they can just stumble through their life and struggle with their temptations. This word of God is powerful and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword, and it can bring victory by the Spirit working through it. So, so he says all these great things to Pastor Polycarp, and uh, so we'll just make this one observation with Ignatius' final wise counsel, Ignatius encourages Polycarp and all in pastoral ministry, I believe this applies, to press on in faithfulness by God's grace. You know, so you just think about this. If you can put yourself in Ignatius' uh, position, you know, he's getting ready to be shipped off. I mean, this is his last stop probably before they get to Rome And uh, he's allowed one last word, one last letter to somebody, and he chooses to write Polycarp and to give him some encouragement in pastoral ministry. And I just find that to be very sweet and uh, very effective. Press on, Polycarp. (laughs) Very good. So any any thoughts about any of those those last letters there? There's a lot that we could say. There's, it's just very rich um, in truth and application and wisdom. But <laughs> I 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can look at how they applied things and, and say, okay, um, let's compare that to our own lives and as a litmus test of are we doing good or do we need to step it up? And, and I think all of this speaks to that, you know. And why is that? Because underlying Ignatius's uh, wise counsel is the Word of God, right? Ignatius isn't just pulling this out of the air. He's not pulling it from Plato or Aristotle, which was very popular around this time. Um, he, is, he is founding his wise words of counsel upon God's truth. And so that's why it still applies today, even though the problems are still the same today, which isn't very encouraging, but <laughs> we are humans, right? And uh, anybody else? Joy. Yeah. 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 I I love that because that is that is exactly what we see, which is just a sign of maturity. But but even to add um, another. More, maybe more specific word into what you just said is this concept of serving and servanthood. He's facing death, but he wants to serve the churches with whatever means he has available, which happens to be letters. And we see the same thing with Polycarp, right? Remember when the soldiers came to Polycarp's house and to arrest him, to take him to be uh, executed? And what did Polycarp do for the soldiers? Yeah. yeah, yeah, prepare a table, eat whatever you want, as much as you want, fill your bellies, I've got plenty. Yeah, he's getting ready to die, <laughs> right? And it's, it's, it's a picture, I think, of servanthood, a very mature servanthood, that even in the face of terrible circumstances, you know, there's this attitude of, I'm going to care for others, like Joy pointed out. So, I think that's great. I think that's great. Well, let's, um, let's maybe make some final uh, summary assessments of Ignatius. There's no blanks to fill in here. You, I think it is on your outline, but I didn't give you any blanks to fill in, so you can thank me later. Um, Ignatius, so we want to just make maybe four observations just about his life as a whole, maybe, and this will maybe help you as kind of a quick summary later if you're you know, wanting to uh, study him more. But first of all, with Ignatius, um, theologically, we understand that he held a very high view of Jesus. Ignatius was not afraid to call Jesus God. And um, in some circles, that would have been very controversial. Uh, for the most part, for the authentic, true church, it wouldn't have been. But for a lot of outlying uh, groups that were really heretics, that would have been controversial um, and so, but we see with Ignatius, he's very bold in the truth and has a very high view of Christ, uh, part of which is that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Another observation about Ignatius is that he believed uh, very strongly, we could say, in the unifying threefold office of the church, right? So he points out that um, uh, from what he saw in Scripture, there are three offices of leadership in the church. You have the bishop, you have the presbyters, and you have the deacons and deaconesses. And through them, the church is, is uh, God uses that to bring unity to the church as well as strength and security and, uh, and blessing and God's glory and all of that. So we see that throughout Ignatius' writings. He believed very strongly in that threefold office. 
Also, Ignatius called the church to further unity by gathering together, right? It wasn't just enough to have uh, this threefold office of leadership in the church, but he very much wants the church to gather together and even more so, which is echoes Hebrews, right? Um, you know, Hebrews is a little bit of a rebuke in there that says, look, don't, don't, um, uh, what's the word? What's the word? Don't, uh, forsake there you go thank you don't forsake the assembling together of yourselves as is the habit of some but rather instead gather together all the more as you see the day of christ approaching and uh and i think this is the same thing that ignatius is pointing out you know there's there's some christians they're kind of on this this downward spiral where they don't get together as much as they used to right they're getting together less and less and less and less and less and that's just a bad habit to get into uh, but instead, Jesus is coming, so therefore gather together all the more. And Ignatius has this same heart. And maybe fourthly, we would say, you know, because martyrdom is such a huge part of these seven letters in his last days here, that uh, Ignatius saw martyrdom as a divine appointment, right? I mean, he embraced it. God is sovereign. I'm his child. I'm his disciple. Uh, must be God's will, right? And so he embraced it as God's divine appointment. And uh, ultimately, that it wasn't empty, but through martyrdom, he would achieve Christ. Through his death, through his suffering, he would achieve Christ. So we talked, you know, about that last week as we read through his letter to the Romans. It's, it's almost uncomfortable when we talk or when we read his letter, especially to the Romans, because it's so graphic about what he expects his execution to look like. You know, the wild beast crunching his bones and those sorts of things. And, and he's all like, I'm going to do it to the glory of Christ. You know, and not because he has a morbid fascination with death, but because he believes he will achieve Christ through it. That this life is, is not the end. And... Uh, a level of faith that is really pretty incredible. Again, showing his maturity in Christ. So along the lines of martyrdom, let's say a couple more things about martyrdom in summary fashion because um, after today, we're going to switch, um, turn corners, I guess you could say, as far as the topic uh, that we're going to be discussing and we're going to be moving from martyrdom to heresy. And so let's just maybe do a quick summary of a couple of things that we could say about martyrdom that we've witnessed in the early church, because we've, we've, we've talked about the martyrdom of Polycarp, uh, we've talked about Ignatius, and uh, so let's just make a couple more summary observations. First of all, I've said this over and over, but here it is again, persecution uh, in the early church uh, during the Roman Empire was mostly sporadic localized, and did not always end in execution, right? The early church made a distinction between persecution and martyrdom. Persecution is where you are oppressed for your faith, maybe even beaten for your faith, but does not lead to death, right? Martyrdom is reserved as being the category whereby you die for your faith. So, so they made a distinction, and, um, and the reason for that is because they held martyrs in very high honor, and so if you were persecuted for your faith, yeah, that's admirable, I guess, and, and noble. You stood firm in your faith. But if you died, then you were considered a martyr. So there was that distinction. But as far as uh, what we see in the early church, with a few exceptions, it was sporadic and it was localized. Um, you know, sometimes Christianity was tolerated, sometimes it wasn't, and uh, just kind of depending on on uh, the situation. So for the most part, you know, the Roman Empire considered Christianity to be an illegal religion, religio illicita, the, the uh, Latin um, legal term for it. Uh, but really, the Roman Empire delegated the outworking of that to the local governors, right? So it'd be like, it'd be like um, if the federal government of the United States said Christianity is illegal in the United States of America, but as far as enforcing it, we're just going to leave it up to the states to enforce it. And so you have uh, Iowa that's maybe a little more tolerant of Christians, but then you go north to Minnesota and they're just, they're just putting them to death one after another, right? So that's, I mean, that's 
that's a bad analogy maybe, but I think it's a good analogy because you understand what I'm talking about now. So hopefully that doesn't happen. But, but that's kind of the way it was with the Roman Empire, right? I mean, there was, Christianity was, was illegal, but depending on where you were at, it was more or less tolerated. Okay? The existing accounts of martyrdom often reflect great faith, though many were faithless and denied Christ. So I think another maybe myth that we have in our minds is that, um, you know, everybody who um, potentially faced the lions stood firm in their faith and faced the lions. But really, the account of scholars as they observe the early church is that uh, just as many, maybe even more so, people who confessed Christ in the face of persecution denied Christ. So... It isn't as if, um, you know, everybody, boy, just stood firm in their faith. In fact, it was probably more people denied Christ than, than stood firm in their faith, if that makes sense. Okay? Another observation is that those who were executed for their faith were honored as true disciples of Christ. And I kind of already touched on this. I gave you this document last week, the letter of the survivors of the persecution at Lyon. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about Lyon because that's where Irenaeus was the bishop at. Um, I'm not, we're not going to get into that this evening, but you can read that on your own time. Um, that document um, talks about a time of persecution and how some didn't die from there, right? They're thrown into the arena and the wild lions and the animals, um, uh, you know, bloody them up pretty bad, but at the end of the day, they're still alive. And so what do you do with them? Well, you put them back in the jail and bring them out in the morning so that there can be more sport had with them. And, uh, and that letter addresses that, that those who survived um, refused to be called martyrs. They were scarred for life, they were mutilated, but they survived and they said, no, we do not deserve the title of martyr because we still have breath in our lungs. And so it just kind of gives us a picture of, you know, the high status that the church had of those who actually did die for their faith. So you can read that document on your own time um, if you want. This stuff's kind of gory, I'm sorry, but that's just where we're at. Um, And maybe the last summary statement that we want to make, this is the important part, right? We've looked at all the gory parts. This is what we need to cling to. That the early church understood that nothing, including death by execution, could separate God's elect from God's love, which is in Christ. Uh, Romans 8, 28 through 39. We read it this evening. We read it last week. And I think, you know, we're, we're, we're <laughs> yeah, we're looking at the martyr dumb stuff and and not just to be gory or to be fascinated with what they went through but to hopefully see uh, the effect on the other side is that their faith stood firm and uh, and and as a result of that it's a picture of Romans Romans 8 there so okay so that concludes Ignatius and uh, any last thoughts or words before we start on Irenaeus? Yeah, Bill. Yeah, you know, that was a huge question in the early church because that did happen. You know, there's, there's people in the church and they're confessing Christ and they're arrested. They're taken to the arena. They deny Christ. They're allowed to go home. And uh, so what do they do? You know, are they allowed to come back into the church after a season of repentance? Uh, um, does it mean that they need to be rebaptized? There were all these questions, right? And, and so because, you know, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is exactly that, right? A denial of Christ. And so, um, you know, uh, different churches dealt with it in different ways. You know, there were some who took a very um, legalistic approach to it, I guess we could say, and said, no, you're out, you're done, there's no second chance for you. Then there were others who said, yeah, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal, um, you know, come and do, you know, 
show your signs of repentance, show forth fruits of repentance, you know, and, and uh, you know, you can be part of us again and because God is gracious and Christ is merciful and, you know, so different churches dealt with it in different ways, I think. Um, but either way, it wasn't, it wasn't good because, you know, there is that temptation in our human flesh of, hey, that guy, I know he kind of got in trouble and he denied Christ. You know, I don't know if I can trust him as a brother. You know what I mean? I mean, that's just where our flesh goes. And uh, so, you know, it was a very bad situation. Um, so anyway, yeah, Janet. Right, and then there's that. So, hey, and Peter was right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, you know, that's just it. I mean, if we were in that situation, I'm sure we would all hope to answer the question rightly. Yes, I am a Christian. No, I will not worship Caesar. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Polycarp too. Yeah, very good. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, what, you know, what happens if we are in that position and we don't answer rightly and we, you know, um, is there still mercy? Is there still grace? Well, Peter's a great example. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, um, I don't know. Something to consider. Joy? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It plays out in a lot of ways, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Sure. Yep. Right, with no chance, right. There is a testimony of, uh, might even be in that document in a different place, um, that, uh, that uh, letter by the survivors of the persecution at Lyon, um, where those who denied Christ and were still executed, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's... Uh, Tough things to think about, right? I mean, very, very tough. All right, so we ready for Irenaeus? All right, I've been ready for Irenaeus for like five years. All right. Irenaeus, this evening we're just going to introduce him. We're going to go through the biography that you is one of your handouts there. And we're going to make a couple of um, observations as far as his contribution to the church, both the early church and how that has uh, worked itself out to the modern church, and uh, and then in the next several weeks, we're going to maybe get a little bit more into his writings and uh, and uh, and see some specific things. So, Irenaeus, an introduction. We begin here with his biography, and we'll say this. We'll start this by saying that he was most likely born in the mid. 140s AD, probably in or around Smyrna. So again, as with Polycarp, as with Ignatius, the details of their childhood really aren't that well known. 
Um, you know, we don't really know who his parents were. We don't really know what town specifically. Uh, we don't even really know for sure what year, but, um, but we can guesstimate that it was probably in the mid-140s, and it was probably in the, re in the region or possibly even in the town of Smyrna. So um, that kind of gives us a, a stepping stone, I guess, as far as where his life began. And so if we take a look at our handy-dandy map, we find uh, down here just our point of reference of Jerusalem. Uh, a little bit south of there is Bethlehem. We have Nazareth. We have the Sea of Galilee. Up here we have Antioch, which is where Ignatius was the pastor. Then if we go over this way, we find uh, Ephesus, very important Christian community. And then just a little bit north of there, we have the town of Smyrna, right on the coast there. And uh, so... Irenaeus was probably born around this area, and then, of course, Smyrna, just by way of reminder, that's where Polycarp was the pastor, okay? So that you know, gives us a little bit more uh, footing, I guess, as we launch into his life. We want to say this about him as well, that Irenaeus is considered to be a sub-apostolic, third-generation disciple of Jesus Christ. Right, So what does that mean? It means that we have Jesus who taught the apostles. The apostles taught the apostolic fathers, which would be um, Polycarp, Ignatius, right? that, that first generation after the apostles. And then after that, we have the sub-apostolic um, era, which would include uh, Irenaeus, Tertullian. Uh, we could even go you know, down the stream quite a ways to Augustine. Um, and, uh, you know, Athanasius and those, those guys that we're going to look at later on down the road. So it might look something like this, right? If we had a visual of it, we have Jesus, right, who taught the gospel and the truth of God's word to the apostles, Peter, Paul, John, Matthew. And then from there, those apostles in turn taught apostolic fathers, and that's a very technical term. The apostolic fathers is that generation right after the apostles, okay? Very specific technical term, so that would include Polycarp. Polycarp was uh, discipled by John. Ignatius, who was probably discipled by uh, possibly Peter, Paul, and John. And so, so they are that first generation after the apostles. But then after that, it kind of is just a vague term of the sub-apostolic era, right? And so we have all the rest. <laughs> and um, as far as this term early church fathers, we would include apostolic fathers and sub-apostolic fathers. It's just kind of a general term. When we're talking about um, early church fathers, or sometimes you'll hear the word patristic, what we're talking about is that whole lump of people, right? We wouldn't be talking about the apostles, we're not talking about Jesus, we're talking about Polycarp and, you know, the following generations after that. Okay, does that make sense? I'll take it, that's a yes. We also know that because he lived in a very unique time, that he was influenced by some fairly notable Christians, uh, two of which, first of all, is that he was a student of Polycarp as a young man or a young boy, not sure what age, but, but he probably sat under Polycarp's teaching for an extended period of time. So this is what we mean by, by this sub-apostolic third-generation disciple. Jesus taught uh, John, John taught Polycarp, Polycarp taught Irenaeus, okay? Also, he was influenced by a man by the name of Justin Martyr. Uh, Martyr is not his last name, just as Christ is not the last name of Jesus, but rather it uh, gives us a picture of how he died. Justin Martyr was... Uh, was a very well-known, very, uh, very much a groundbreaking apologist in the church, in the early church, which means that he made a defense for the faith of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, 1 Peter 3.15 is where we get that word, apologia. So he was uh, influenced by the apologist Justin Martyr while living in Rome. So as we track his, 
his, uh, his trajectory of his life. We find him being born somewhere around Smyrna, possibly in Smyrna. At some point in his life, he, he travels to the city of Rome where he falls under the influence of Justin Martyr and, and, uh, and the apologetic uh, discourse, I guess, that, that Justin Martyr used as far as um, making uh, statements of faith to those who were unbelievers, especially to the Jewish community. And uh, so he was influenced by both of these uh, very notable early Christians. Then we find during the 160s AD, again, we don't know an exact date, but during the 160s, he moved to Lyon in southern Gaul, which is modern day France. So Smyrna to Rome to France is the trajectory of his life, and then he would spend out uh, the remainder, uh, remainder of his years in Lyon and the the community right south of there of Vienne. So geographically, this is kind of important because geographically, Lyon is separated from the city of Rome by the Alps. So I'll show you a map here in a moment, but this is important. So you have the civilization of the Roman Empire that is centered around the city of Rome, and then you have the Alps, and on the other side of the Alps, you have Gaul or modern-day France, uh, where Irenaeus was. So though Lyon and the neighboring city of Vienne were in the Roman Empire, because of their location, they were kind of considered on the frontier, right? So if you can imagine, um, it was certainly well populated, but not so much by the civilized Roman people, okay? So if we were to look at it on a map, and unfortunately this doesn't show the topography of things very well, but but if we see here, we have uh, Roma, or you know, the city of Rome down here in modern-day Italy. And if we go up here, this, this white line is basically where the Alps are at, and it kind of curves around this way. And on this side of the Alps, in the region of Gaul, would have been Lyon. And so we find that it's really separated. So if you want to go to Lyon from Rome, you're either going to have to take a boat and go across the waters... Or you're going to have to go across the mountains somehow, find a, a mountain pass to get there. And so, you know, so this all kind of lent itself to this separation of, of civilization in a sense. It was all part of the Roman Empire. The Romans had conquered this region of Gaul. But, but as you can imagine, before the age of, of easy travel, um, this would have made life pretty difficult. Especially in the winter months, right? Now, you're probably not going to go to Gaul from Rome in the winter months. You're not going to cross the the Alps during that season of the year, okay? So, culturally, the context of Lyon was a Roman colony with a lot of Celtic migration. So the Celts were the people that occupied this region of the world at this point in time. The uh, Roman Empire called them Gauls. Uh, and that's why they named the region Gaul, but it was essentially the same group of people as the Celts. And uh, there was a lot of Celtic migration through this region. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe it was because of that mountain range that maybe they followed that. I, I really don't know, uh, to be honest with you. So this, if we take all of those threads and tie them together, this produced a situation where Irenaeus was a Greek-speaking Christian, right? He's from the east in Smyrna, in a Latin colony of the Roman Empire, surrounded by Celtic barbarians on the fringes of civilization. That kind of gives you a picture of Irenaeus, right? So we looked at, you know, I mean, you look at him there and you think, oh, he's a, you know, <laughs> he's a, I don't know what the term would be, he's, he's uh, refined, you know. Well, you know, the, the reality of it was he was living in a, a rough part of the world, it was populated, it wasn't that, you know, but it was, uh, you know, maybe kind of like the wild, wild west in some ways. So then around 174 AD, he's not a pastor yet, he's in Lyon, he's in Gaul, and, and possibly in that, uh, the town right south of there of Vienne, in this Christian community. Uh, around 174 AD, he was sent by his church to deliver a letter to the church in Rome, out of an increasing concern of heresy, right? There's reports coming out of the church in Rome that 
there's heretical things going on, and the church in Lyon uh, wants to address those things, and so they write a letter, and they give it to Irenaeus, and they send him to Rome. Okay, that's 174 AD. When he gets to Rome, there are two shocking discoveries that he made on, that he made on, a, on a personal level. The first of which is that the bishop of Rome, the pastor of Rome, Eleutherus, had embraced the heresy of Montanism. We'll talk more about these heresies um, down the road, but Montanism was a heresy that was really centered around a false teaching of the Holy Spirit. It was this whole idea that, hey, we have the Holy Spirit, therefore we don't need the Word of God. Uh, we can just receive revelation directly from the Spirit, and thus saith the Lord, I have this subjective um, experience, and therefore that becomes truth in the church. And, you know, who cares what Paul said? Who even cares about what Isaiah said? You know, that's all kind of a past um, dispensation. And so Montanism, uh, we'll, like I said, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about it later, but Montanism just essentially was this heresy that was centered around a false understanding of the Holy Spirit because it denied the sufficiency of Scripture, okay? Secondly, he discovers that a friend and a fellow student of Polycarp had embraced the heresy of Gnosticism, which is another uh, huge heresy that is in the earth, that is, uh, you know, on the outskirts of the early church and uh, causes a lot of damage. And we're going to talk a lot about Gnosticism and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. I mean, there is no greater source of science fiction created by man other than Gnosticism. It's going to be a great time. But anyway, so he gets there and he, he uh, comes into contact with his old, old buddy whom they both served under Polycarp and he realizes that he's embraced Gnosticism. Gnosticism um, at its core is a heresy which believed in a secret knowledge of God that's not available to the whole church, only to special Christians who have received this special knowledge, which is what uh, Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And uh, so there was this secret knowledge that some Christians had that others didn't. And uh, it is just bizarre, but it's really fun to, to talk about. Um, so, so he is really put off by these two things, okay? And this is really probably pretty important for um, his ministry in the rest of his life, because as a result, he um, produces um, maybe the greatest um, book on heresiology against heresy that the church has. And uh, so we're going to talk a lot about that. And, uh, but you can imagine that would have been very discouraging, right? Um, the church in Rome is important, right? This is um, Paul and Peter were there. And this is also where they were martyred. And there's, there's, a, there's a rich, vibrant community of Christians in the church in Rome. But here's their pastor, and he's embraced this heresy of Montanism. And then also his buddy that has embraced Gnosticism. So anyway, we'll come back to that maybe a little bit more as far as those specific heresies are concerned. So that's, that's the year 174 AD, probably maybe 175. In the year 177 AD, and we know that date for sure, during his absence, so he's in Rome, a severe localized persecution broke out in Lyon and Vienne under Emperor Marcus Aurelius. So while Irenaeus is gone, providentially so, there is a very severe persecution that breaks out in his hometown among his, his uh, church people. So Irenaeus is not the pastor at this time. He may be an elder in the church, but he's not the pastor yet. And uh, so he escapes this persecution, while many of the Christians there didn't. So we have... This is a picture of the arena in Lyon that you can go today and you can see it. These are the remains of the arena. And uh, you might notice here, you've got you know, the seating over here probably. And this is the arena floor. And over here is this post. And that post uh, represents most likely where the Christians were staked to the ground and the wild beasts were let loose on them. 
And you can still, like I said, you can go to Lyon today and you can see this. It's a monument of sorts. Now, here's the incredible thing as I was thinking about this today, right? So I showed you a few weeks ago the Colosseum in Rome. It's this massive structure, right? It has several tiers. And uh, you go there to watch an execution. Well, you might be three floors up. And you are far removed as far as distance is concerned from the actual violence and brutality that's happening, right? Well, this arena here is probably, you know, what, 40, 50 feet? You know, so if you're standing here and, you know, somebody is being mauled to death over here, I mean, that's just like, I couldn't even imagine that. How terrible that would have been. But yet they called it entertainment. They called it justice. We need to get rid of these Christians who are atheists and don't believe in the Roman gods. Terrible, terrible, terrible. So, Irenaeus is in Rome. Persecution is happening. He returns to Lyon, arrives at Lyon, and he discovers that the bishop, Pothinus, has been martyred and he is now the new bishop. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, the former pastor was taken to the arena and executed. And uh, guess what, Irenaeus? You're the new pastor. Hmm. So, fast forward, he becomes the bishop of Lyon. Fast forward a few years, during the years of 189 to 198 A.D., and those are very broad um, years, I, you know, it's probably more specific than that, but during those years, he lived up to his name Irenaeus, which in Greek means peacemaker, and uh, he is involved in the Paschal controversy and brings peace to that situation. Okay, so let me explain what that is. We talked about this briefly when we talked about Polycarp, but... Uh, the Paschal debate was a debate with the Roman church over the date of Pascha, uh, which is Passover Easter, the day that Jesus was crucified, and also the nature of fasting with it, right? So the tradition came to be that every year at, uh, at Passover Easter, the day that we celebrate the crucifixion of Christ, that the church fasts, okay? But there was a problem that the Roman church didn't agree on the date as well as the nature of how long the fast should last. And so this became a problem. And uh, we saw this, and like I said, we'd have to go back a, a, a few lessons, but we saw this uh, when we were talking about Polycarp. And so we have Anicetus, who is uh, the former bishop of Rome, and Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, that they had really left the issue unresolved in the previous generation. If you remember that, I was using that situation to help show the heart and the gentleness of Polycarp. That Polycarp waded into this debate and said, look, this is a secondary issue. Whether you fast for a day or whether you fast for two days, um, it's really not that big of a deal. And really, we shouldn't divide the body of Christ over it. And, and Polycarp just really had this gentle, humble spirit about himself. And he was able to influence uh, Bishop Anicetus, and they really just kind of left it at the end of the day that, okay, we'll just, you know, agree to disagree. It's a secondary issue. It's not that big of a deal, okay? Well, the next generation of bishops come along in Rome, a man by the name of Victor, and he was not willing to compromise in this. No, it is this date, and if you don't agree with us, then we are no longer going to have fellowship. And uh, so even in the early days of the church in Rome, you see some contention, right? It's interesting if you track that whole line there. But anyway, so the church in Rome was rebuked and peace was established in large part due to Irenaeus' influence. So, you know, that's a huge story. But um, at the end of the day, Irenaeus was very much influential, living up to his name of peacemaker in which the situation was resolved. Uh, there is a kind of mild rebuke given to Victor, and, uh, and unity was restored, okay? So it gives you just a picture of the heart of Irenaeus, maybe, as well as his character. Now, the Roman Catholic Church probably isn't too hip on that story, right? 
because they see the succession of popes as being unable to be rebuked. And here we have Irenaeus, the bishop from another church, rebuking the bishop of Rome. And, you know, so they've got a different probably story than what I'm sharing with you, which is from um, Irenaeus' life and his writings. No, I mean, it, it wasn't formalized until, you know, centuries later. Um, Gregory the Great was probably the last true good bishop of the Church of Rome, and after that it really went downhill in the Middle Ages, and yeah, and uh, yeah. But it's funny, you see echoes of it here and there along the way of some obstinacy, some, you know, we, we want more power than you, and you know, most likely that's because they're, they're in the seat of governmental authority, right? And that's bleeding into the church, and Anyway, there's, there's a, that's a whole field of study, um, which we don't have time for. But. So shortly after this victory, another persecution breaks out under Emperor Severus in which possibly thousands of Irenaeus' Christian community are martyred. So there's, you know, as we talked about, um, you know, persecution along with martyrdom was very sporadic, very localized. It was here and then it was there and then it was sometimes now, sometimes later. And um, well, we find that a couple of times persecution was very severe in uh, the community of Lyon and Vienne. And, uh, and we see here a second time in Irenaeus' life that persecution in this, in this area was, was very ugly. And, uh, and possibly thousands were martyred during this time. Irenaeus himself dies probably around the year 202 A.D., though probably he was not a martyr. Um, scholars go back and forth on this, you know, and you read the older writings of Irenaeus, and they say, yeah, he was probably martyred. And then you read, you know, some in the early 1900s, and they're like, no, he wasn't martyred. And then sometimes, you know, so just kind of the uh, scholastic academic thought just kind of goes in circles and, and, uh, and, and trends in a sense. But modern uh, academia would probably say that he was not martyred. But we really don't know. Really don't know how he died for sure. Okay, any questions about his biography? Okay, we got uh, about five minutes left. Let's talk about his contributions to the church. And uh, Irenaeus is arguably one of the most important theologians that the church has, but especially so in the second century. He is considered the most important theologian of the second century, period. So we have Tertullian. We're going to talk about him in a month or so. Um, but all these others don't compare in contrast to Irenaeus. He is considered the most important theologian of the second century church. And it's interesting because he's out there on the fringes of society, you know, and is, uh, you know, faces a couple of different waves of persecution, um, you know, wrangles with heresy and all these sorts of things. Um, but all of that proves him and proves his character. And, uh, and so we see him as very, very important, not only then, but today. So we want to say five things about that. Why is he such an important theologian? There's five things. I think these are on your outline First of all, is that he represents movement from, away from, an apologetic focus outside of the church to a theological focus within the church, right? So in the early church, there is this whole group of Christians known as the apologists, right? Justin Martyr was one of the groundbreaking apologists, and there were many others, and their focus was to defend uh, Scripture, the faith uh, in Christ against those who are unbelievers, usually the Jews and the Judaizers, right? Those who said, well, yeah, you need the, the uh, Jesus is okay, but you also need the law to be truly justified, right? And so there's a lot of things like that. But, but, uh, but you have this whole apologetic movement within the early church uh, that, that really served to defend faith in Christ outside the church, Irenaeus comes along and he, he, he shows, um, 
he marks a different path and that his focus is in the church and becomes very important in his theological doctrines that are developed um, as a result, most of which is because of the threat of heresy, right? You have the Gnostics who say, yeah, we're Christians too, and Irenaeus is like, no, you're not, and here's why. And so he becomes a very important theologian inside the church with his focus in the church, strengthening the church from the inside out, we could say. Does that make sense? Okay. Secondly, Irenaeus brought biblical clarity where there was speculative confusion through the witness of the apostles, right? This is the early church. Put yourself in their feet. This thing is a new religion in the sense, um, sure, it has Jewish roots, but, you know, um, as far as it's spread within the Roman Empire, this is kind of a new religion, and there's all this speculation, right? And so as a result, you have um, the Montanists, you have the Gnosticists, you have the um, the Ebionites, you have all of these fringe groups that are really heretical that are saying, yeah, we're Christian too. Um, Jesus is, um, was just a man. He's not really God, but hey, we're, we're with you. We're Christians too. We can worship together. And, uh, and there's all this speculation about who Jesus was, how the church should function. Um, creation is a huge, huge part of this conversation. And, uh, and Irenaeus steps up with the word of God, with the um, apostolic succession of teaching and truth and just clears the floor. Says, nope, this is it. This is orthodox, that is not. And really sets the standards. He's very, very important for that. And it isn't that, you know, once again, it isn't that he's just coming up with this stuff. He is basing it on the teaching of the apostles. Okay? And you'll see this later. So trust me now, you'll see it later, Okay? Thirdly, Irenaeus provides an effective model for approaching heresy used by later Christians, right? So here's the thing. Um, Irenaeus, so here is, here is his book against heresies, and it's thick. It's thick, 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 and small print, right? And he wrote this book. It's, it's, it's really five books in one, but the whole first book is spent outlining what Gnosticism is. So before he gets into his argument of you Gnostics are heretics, he first spends a lot of time in great detail explaining what the Gnostics believe. And the Gnostics are like, yeah, you're right. You've got us to a T. That's who we are, right? We are A, B, C, and D. And then he spends the next four books saying, this is why A is wrong, this is why your B is wrong, this is why your C is wrong, this is why your D is wrong. And it's just so right and so godly. Right? Before we jump down somebody's throat about being wrong, we better make sure that we have their perspective right first. And he sets that example very, very well. And so, a lot of Later Christians who kind of, um, you know, their ministry was kind of in the same vein, you know, um, you know, attacking the heretics and, and exposing their false teachings and stuff, followed the same rule, right? And so, you know, okay, we're going to, before I jump down the throat of the Jehovah's Witnesses, right, I'm going to know what they believe first, and then I can be effective to knock down their tower. Right? So, anyway, a lot can be said about that, but um, Irenaeus is very important for that. Fourthly, is that he provides the perspective that all of redemptive history concludes with Jesus Christ. This is probably the most important thing. Everything culminates at Christ. The Old Testament, what was the point of it? Jesus Christ. The law, what was the point of it? Jesus Christ. The Sabbath, what's the point of it? Jesus Christ. All of these things point to Christ. And he makes a, just a beautiful, uh, I mean, it's just like, it's, it's, uh, it's just over and over and over and over again. And it's, um, you know, the technical term is recapitulation. Everything is recapitulated in Christ. Okay? We'll talk more about these things later. So if this seems like, wow, what's he talking about? Don't worry about it. We'll come back to it later in the weeks ahead, Lord willing. 
Fifthly, is that Irenaeus presents a theology which is very approachable, right? Irenaeus is easy to read. I mean, if, if you spend any amount of time at all in the scriptures, this is going to be easy stuff to read. He, he's, very, he's very approachable, right? Versus, say, uh, somebody like Augustine. And I don't, want to, uh, you know, I don't want to turn you away from Augustine because we're going to get to him later. But, but Augustine talks about these concepts like what role does, does man's will have in salvation? You know, and he gets into it and he you know, attacks Pelagius and semi-Pelagianism and just, you know, and it's like, wow, what did I just read, right? Um, he, Augustine approaches topics like the Trinity. You know, I had to read... Um, I had to read his, his book on the Trinity for school, and I remember I came to chapter 4, I think it was, and I had to write um, uh, a discussion about that chapter, and I, I kid you not, I read that chapter five times, and I was still like, I have no idea what I just read. I have no clue. And, and <laughs> funny story. So you know what I did? I, I, I wrote in my, in my uh, assignment, I wrote... Um, after reading chapter 4, I don't think anybody except for God and Augustine knows what Augustine has just said. And I submitted it, and I got full credit. <laughs> yeah. So Augustine is that level, that depth of theology. Now, not all of his stuff is that way, right? A lot of Augustine is very approachable. But some of it is just like, okay, i got to read this one word at a time because this is, you know, it's just so complex, right? Augustine's a genius, right? Um, and I'm not saying that Irenaeus isn't. But what he has written is very approachable for us. We can understand it very easily, I think. Okay? So that's, that's important too. So, we have today two of his written works that have been preserved that God has chosen providentially to uh, keep intact for us. The first one, the full title is The Detection and Overthrow of the Knowledge Falsely So-Called. And I love that title. The shorter title is Against Heresies. And, uh, and so we have, that, uh, we have that in English today. The second title is The Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching. It is a much shorter book. Uh, as a matter of fact, last week I gave you part one of this as your handout, and uh, I'll give you part two in a couple of weeks, maybe. Um, the shorter title for that is On the Apostolic Preaching, and it's just very simple, very straightforward, that we have the truth of God, and it is demonstrated by the teaching of the apostles, right? Jesus taught the apostles, the apostles taught the apostolic fathers, the apostolic fathers have passed that on to us, and so to today... We have that same truth because it's been passed on, right? Apostolic succession of teaching. And so that's basically the essence of that book. Not necessarily outlining, um, you know, the technical aspects of that, but actually modeling it from Genesis to Revelation, okay? So then we also have, uh, reportedly, there are six lost works of Irenaeus um, that we know of. So other church fathers quoted other works of Irenaeus. So Irenaeus was a very important figure, although he was living on the fringes of society. Um, in a sense, um, the rest of the church recognized how important his works were. And so we have um, other church fathers who referenced um, works other than these two. And so, you know, we do a little bit of uh, clue finding and sleuthing, and we realize, well, there must be other works of Irenaeus, but they've been lost in the sands of time. Okay, so any questions? You probably have a lot of questions, right? So what I have just said, we're going to unpack in the next several weeks, and hopefully you'll see it more clearly. So really, in a way, we've kind of turned a corner. So we've, 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 um, we've broke the ice a bit with Polycarp and with Ignatius, but now we're really going to get into the meat of things as far as what the early church taught and believed. And uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. So. so for study for next week, we're, doing, we're going to break the ice further as far as Irenaeus, context of Irenaeus is concerned. This was your second handout that you had when you came in this evening. Uh, there's two snippets of, uh, of document there. The first part is the rule of faith, which is from 
uh, from this book, Against Heresies. And then on the back side, there's a shorter snippet uh, called Keep to the Rule of Faith, which is from on the apostolic preaching. And uh, this is a great doorway and gateway into Irenaeus and his teaching. So we want to start there. And so that's your, that's your homework for next week. You can read that. It's just two pages. And so um, any last thoughts? Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your love to us, and that's demonstrated not only in that you sent your son, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us, but also we see it, um, God, in your encouragement to us through so many different means, through the word of God, through the indwelling Holy Spirit, but also through the witness of the early church. And Father, as we have looked at Polycarp and Ignatius and are now going to be looking at Irenaeus, Father, I pray at the end of the day that our faith would be encouraged because of the life and the teaching that they held to. And um, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, and uh, we'll see you soon.